presentations. Um, so right now uh, we are going to our uh, second session, um, which is going to be uh, um, uh, chaired by Dia Gupta. Um, our second session uh, focuses on shifting the, the focus, um, objects, uh, belonging, and memories. Um, so yes, I have the pleasure to introduce Dia Gupta, who is currently a past and present fellow in race, ethnicity, and equality in history at the Royal Historical Society um, and the Institute of Historical Research. Uh, Dia is uh, a literary and cultural historian uh, interested in the intersections um, between life, um, uh, between life writing, visual and material culture, literature, uh, particularly in response to war. Um, her first book, uh, which is under uh, contract with Oxford University Press, congratulations, uh, and Hearst, um, is on an emotional history of India in the Second World War. Uh, thank you so much, Dia, for joining us today. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Benja, and welcome everyone to this second session, which is the first of our student-led panels today. Um, you're at the Devel De Devolving Restitution Workshop at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And can we all agree it's been a fantastic start to this workshop? I've been absolutely riveted by the presentations we've heard so far. Now, I have um, the privilege and the honor to chair this student-led session. Um, and here's the shift in focus. So we're moving away from researchers to student voices. So as Benja explained, um, I'm past and present postdoctoral fellow at the Royal Historical Society, and I'm really interested on race and equality initiatives within the discipline of history. Um, this panel, I think, really speaks to some of those initiatives. It's entirely led by students from the Cambridge African and Caribbean Society, or Cambridge ACS, as it's known. And the five students you'll be hearing from today have been working with the museum for a while on museum collections and on providing fresh perspectives on the museum's Af African collections. So in these um, student presentations, you'll find that students have focused on a particular object or group of objects, and then they will talk you through their interpretation and understanding of those objects. Um, so our first speaker is Amel Eleli, and I'm gonna introduce her now. She's a second year, second year history and politics student at Corpus Christi College at Cambridge. And her project at the museum explores what sovereignty has looked like for East African queens in the 19th century, particularly in Ethiopia. And she will be talking to us today about the state robe of Queen Wazaro Terunesh of Ethiopia, which was taken after the Battle of Magdala in 1868. Amel explores how this cloak transcends its status as, a so as an item of sovereign sovereignty into becoming an object of resistance. Can we please play Amel's video now, please? Hello, my name is Amel and I am a second year history and politics student at Corpus Christi College. And I'm here today to talk about a cloak which i found was really interesting in relation to the topic of objects of sovereignty and this cloak in particular is from 19th century ethiopia and it's also stored as object 7 19 18 4 but i will go into describing the cloak um in a bit um i initially chose to research this object because i found this garment to be the most opulent in the collection um, which was acquired by the Victorian Albert Museum in 1934. And I, from there, found out that it actually belonged to a sovereign queen, Wazuru Turanesh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. And kind of, so obviously, because it's such a clear connection to sovereignty, um, secured um, my decision to study this cloak. And as an East African woman myself, I also found that this would have been, and it has been, a really good opportunity to learn more about my history and, of course, the history of the cloak in relation to Queen Wazuru Turanesh. And I found that quite quickly, this cloak just transcends this idea of it being an object of sovereignty. It found that more so it was an object of 
complete and utter resistance. I found that the cloak, while it obviously embodied riches and power because it belonged to a queen, it more than that signified just a complete resentment to the role of empress in the patriarchal world Queen Wazora Taranesh was found herself in and found herself completely powerless in as well. Um, to talk a little bit about the Queen herself, um, she married to Adras the second, but she had come from royalty before that. Um, her father was an emperor and had been fighting practically all his life to be the complete emperor of Ethiopia, but he had lost in battle to Tuadros the second, and at the time Tuadros um, had lost his first wife, whom didn't produce an heir for him, and so at the same time, um, it's almost as a Rosora Turanesh knew what her fate was. She spent a lot of time during and after the battle praying and fasting and even promising to enter a convent, but she found herself instead in a marriage to a man that she did not like. But this is kind of the way things happened. She was perceived as an object of sovereignty herself to kind of upstill um to address the second's um, reign. So her wishes had to be cast aside. And unfortunately, in my research, and I feel like I should make this very, very clear, a lot of what I'm saying here is based on complete legend. There is not much historiography or primary resources at all recorded about how this marriage actually came to be or what kind of persisted in this marriage. All I can find out and what I can tell is that this marriage was not based on love, not based on any mutual respect, it was very, very transactional and very much against Wazoro Turanesh's wishes. And I found that very interesting as a student of history myself that a lot of what I'm based on, like what I've done my researching on and what it's based on is based on word of mouth which is of course not what I'm used to and not what my lectures or my, my reading is based on at all and I found that in a way it definitely made me feel closer to the queen herself and what this cloak signified but it definitely raises the question of of course the case the reason why this is the case is quite obvious there's a colonial aspect to it there's an academic aspect to it but I found that as quite an interesting point to consider that there is even in my research a complete utter disparity in relation to how this manifests in African history and how this is the case in English and British and just complete Western history. But now knowing how Queen Wazora Turanesh acquired her um, sovereignty, it is no doubt that she kind of had a very unconventional relationship with her role, both politically and personally. I say politically as well, because from the get go, she knew that her presence, and this is definitely the take case for both female sovereigns at this time in the world, 19th, 18th centuries, that her presence was much more um, necessarily was much more her presence sorry was what was political she needed to represent a madonna she needs to represent herself as a pious woman as the mother of an heir and that was her only input she, it was the world was far too patriarchal for her role to have expanded further than that which kind of takes away me already the opulence of this cloak and how much really it is an object of sovereignty but for me, her personal stake in relation to her sovereignty was far more interesting in the fact that it it clearly is much more complicated that she is married to Tuadros II because of her father's loss in a battle, which then makes this cloak also much more complex than it being just a beautiful garment for a queen to wear it tells a story about a very complicated family and family honour and how through, even as a queen, Queen Wazora Turanesh was still very um, objectified by men. But to describe the cloak 
Um, it was made of dark blue silk with a lighter blue floral design on the inside. It's beautifully adorned with um, decorated with metal pieces on the back and it kind of emulates flowers and sun and the sun, which is very typical um, like Christian iconography. It's particularly in Ethiopian culture. Like I said, it's very opulent and demonstrative of a royal status. It looks very heavy with the amount of metal and gold and silver on it. And in relation to the shape of it, it's not atypical. A lot of Ethiopian and I want to say East African women were wear these type of cloaks generally. But now to talk quickly about um, how this cloak was sieged. This was taken ironically in battle as well. This is how Teodros II kind of ends his reign as well by suicide because he loses a battle to the British and it's the British that sees this cloak, of course, particularly um, the British Expeditionary Force. So Robert Napier um, had planned to take the Empress and her son with them to Britain and one of the things that they'd carried was this cloak. Um, the Queen did not make it. She had died shortly after the battle, assuming because of the stress or perhaps sickness. But retrospectively, it's quite clear why Napier had wanted to take the Queen and the cloak, this very white saviour complex idea that, of course, was not atypical in this colonial era. But obviously that shows a breach of ethics and quite an imperialistic cultural insensitivity and that's how it was taken to Britain but there's about 70 years unaccounted for so that this cloak was transported to Britain in the 19th century it ended up in India as well and it was George Dundas Campbell that had brought this to the Victorian Albert Museum in 1934 and then from there, you can say that the process of restitution has occurred because it's been transported from a national to now a university museum. But I still think there's much, much more work that can be done, even though these conversations about restitution have not actually begun in the Ethiopian government or generally. Um, I still think that it rightfully belongs in Ethiopia, that it belonged to a queen that there's not even much about in history. I could not even find an image of Queen Rosora Turanesh. And I, of course, that that's why I think it further reinforces why I think this cloak rightfully belongs there. There's no contention there. But until then, until that can be in reality, I think because a lot of this history I've told you here is word of mouth, I think the best way to look after this cloak in a museum is to kind of can give it give it its moment retell the story but also make sure that it is set in this context that I've just explained to you here that it is not just a beautiful garment and it belonged to a really really beautiful and rich queen it is a story of struggle here like I have just mentioned and that's the point where I'll summarize real quickly um like I've said this cloak belonged to Empress Ruzaro Trinesh and it tells of course like I've said a story of sovereignty that's much more complicated than riches and I found it quite ironic that this is a garment that conceals one identity and as I soon did my research I found that Ruzaro Trinesh had no identity in such a world of men and listening to what her father wanted of her what to, to address the second of her I found herself completely lost in the story and ironically that is not what you think of when you think of sovereignty and her sovereignty was the complete opposite of the humble and selfless life Rosario Turanesh had wanted for her by dedicating for herself by dedicating herself to the church instead she's been a direct divide into a wife and into a queen but I think the fact remains that she was still an empress and that's why I think through this cloak, I've learned that sovereignty is really not always what is first assumed. Thank you so much for that, Amel, for those incredible insights into that cloak. 
Um, I think you really brought a lot of richness uh, to your perspectives. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, Renee Dale. She is a second year student at Cambridge and she studies education, psychology and uh, learning at Gonville and Keys College. Her project at the museum looks into gold and silver items from the East African region, exploring the cultural significance of jewelry to Somali peoples. In particular here, we're going to hear um, Renee speak about gold earrings from Somalia and how she connects these earrings to her own grandmother and to her own family history. Can we please play Renee's video now? When starting the MAA project, I knew that I wanted to do something that related to my identity, where I am half Somali. I really wanted to explore some items related to that region and see um, if it correlated with any of my own experiences and whether I could add any insight into what I've grown up with and related that to the piece itself. And I was really lucky to um, fall upon this item because it is something that resonated very well with the experiences I've had growing up and the experiences that generations before me have had in their lifespans. Um, so the item that I managed to find were gold and silver jewelry, and hence the name of my project, which is the Crafts of Gold and Silver in Somalia. They are really ornate pieces, which I will go on to describe in a second. And they really reminded me of the things that particularly my grandma passed down to me and what lies as a really important factor in Somali culture, particularly for women. I'm now going to describe the image that I focus my project on. A lot of the interpretations that I'm about to give are based on things that I've seen in my family home and in my grandma's home growing up. Um, so they could um, be interpreted differently by different people, but this is describing what I see. So to so the top left of the picture, we have a thick black bangle, which I've seen typically adorned by older men in the Somali region, typically at weddings. To the middle of the picture, we have a ornate collared necklace. From what I see, it's been inscribed with ridges towards the edges of the necklace. And I believe it's got some sort of embellishment around the rim of the picture. I have seen this quite frequently in a more pure gold form um, for married women on their wedding days. Um, it's very common for them to have really ornate collars on them to show that they are the bride. To the right of the picture, we have a set of two trinkets, one large and one small. I see these all the time in my grandma's home. They're sometimes used for decoration, sometimes um, they actually hold stuff in them, which is really um, useful. We've got a set of three tasseled ornament kind of things in the bottom right of the picture. I know that the two on the side are a set of earrings, which are very common, again, for weddings and for younger girls. I've got something similar to these that my grandma gave me when I was younger, and I'll get onto that in a little bit, but they tend to be passed down through generations, which is really, really interesting. And to the left of the picture, we have a either necklace or a belt, which is, again, used for decoration on a woman's body. I've seen them typically partnered with a particular Somali dress, which is um, orange striped. And again, this isn't exclusive for weddings, but you typically see this as wedding attire or in younger girls for Eid, Ramadan and other celebrations of the sort. In talking about the importance of jewellery in terms of my experiences, I know that gold and silver have been heavily weighted in my culture as a means of exemplifying your own beauty and carrying yourself as a woman in society. My grandma passed down these earrings to me to hold for the rest of my life and now they never leave my ears. And to me, they are a demonstration of my knowledge, my wisdom and my inner beauty and what it means to be a woman. Obviously, it differs from person to person, but to me, that's what the um, value of jewellery is and what I see when I think of gold and silver. This was explored a lot more when I was doing my research where um, researchers such as Silverman and Sabania quoted that the um, adornment of gold and silver was something that was exclusive to royalty. And to me, that made me think, you know, if I have these in my ears every day, that makes me feel like regal. And, you know, my ancestors were somewhat regal in that they had this in their possession so readily and it was something that they wore and held very close to their chest, which is really interesting. 
another part of the research that really interests me was something that was said by Stern in 1968. So ornaments were regarded to be the rage of all the rich and the poor. Those who possessed the means to carry their love for this jewelry, um, they often had like three pounds of weight of silver bells around their necks, which dangled down, which is very, really reminiscent of the jewelry that um, Somali women wear to weddings and on a casual basis as well. And it was really interesting to kind of draw those links between existing literature and what I've seen in my culture. So in that regard, gold and silver are really important to me in showing my culture, showing that I do have some Somali heritage, East African heritage, and it is something that I carry with me very close to my heart. I do also think, and this was something that I heavily explored in my research as well, that me having jewelry also had like an ulterior motive, I guess. So when my grandma did give me these earrings, she kind of emphasized that these earrings are like a stability thing for me because if anything went wrong or if I needed financial support, I could sell these earrings on and it would be something that would help keep me afloat in her words. So it was really interesting to examine the extent to which the way my grandma told me to keep these in case of financial, financial need, the ways in which Somali people and people in the East Africa region may have relied on gold and silver as a means of financial stability to them. This was also emphasized by Silverman and Sabanya who quoted that silver and or gold jewelry functioned as financial assets that can easily be liquefied in times of need. And so this to me demonstrated that not only does gold and silver look pretty, it serves an ulterior pur purpose of helping people who might need it in the future have that level of stability so they're not left in the dust basically. And that really resonated well with me because I see it all the time in my family and my culture. Um, we do kind of rely on these things to keep us afloat and we've had to rely on these things in light of things like colonialism and all of that kind of thing. So I think there was a really interesting outlook that I developed on the line between cultural importance of gold and silver as well as kind of financial, I guess. So that was a really interesting facet that I got to explore during this project. So some of the conclusions that I came to with this presentation was that though we have a rough idea of where this item came from, so the Horn of Africa, East Africa, etc., we cannot pinpoint or we're not able to pinpoint the exact origins of these items. And in doing so, it's naturally going to take away some of the history that we can actually confirm or even deny. And I think that is a flaw because if we have these items in museums where people from all different walks of life are going to be able to see these items and recognize that these items exist, if we're not appreciating the entire history of these items and the richness of said history, we're missing out on a lot of knowledge that could be of benefit to so many different types of people. Um, Dela Cruz, which is on this slide, worded it perfectly where the function and content of art needs to consider the social, the religious, the political and individual facets that make an item an item. And I think museums across the world need to be doing a lot more to ensure that these items have their histories upheld so that people who do go into these museums in favour of um, exploring different cultures and viewing history from different lenses are exposed to the actual history of the items and appreciating the richness in which it has because I know that my culture and other cultures in Africa and across the world are so rich and cannot even simply be boiled down to the experiences that I've demonstrated to you today and so by doing a lot more in terms of ascertaining the history of these items and how these items come to be and the influence that it has on the people today and before us it will do so much to ensure that these items have a solid influential base in the museums rather than just being viewed for face value because no item should be viewed as a face value item and you know to draw it back to the ideas of gold and silver which was the focus of my piece Silverman and Sabania sum out quite well by saying that a systematic survey of museum collections and private collections of gold and silver jewellery must be pursued to develop an understanding of the social and cultural dynamics that have driven this exchange over the millennia. Silver and gold as items cannot just be understood by eight minute presentation. It has such rich histories that extend towards Arab countries 
and other regions of Africa and across the world. And by honouring the fact that these items have such rich histories, we'll be doing a lot to ensure that the integrity of these items is upheld and that we can begin to have more discussions like these to determine, you know, the histories of the items and the place that it holds in so many people's lives. And it will help people like me to realise that these gold earrings hold a lot more weight than just being an item of beauty, an item of religion, an item of financial commodity. I can probably begin to uncover so much history that I didn't even know existed, providing that we actually make the conscious effort to go into that much detail. Thank you so much, Rene, for that brilliant insight into jewellery from Somalia. Um, I think you've really told us what museums need to know, need to do to be able to display these artifacts properly and to talk about them in their real live contexts. I'm going to try and move on now to our next speaker, Sarah um, Shayerly. Sarah is an undergraduate student of human, social and political sciences at Cambridge. Her interest in photography and Benin women's sovereignty comes from her own cultural heritage and hopes. And Sarah is from Benin City and Germany and has grown up in England. Being a woman of mixed heritage and having a keen eye for social and political interactions and exchanges, she was drawn to this project at the museum. Sarah will focus on three photographs for us on Edo women in Benin City. The photographs were taken by Northcote Thomas, who we've already heard about today. Uh, Thomas arrived in Benin City 12 years after its sacking. And Sarah asks, how women have been discriminated in Benin since colonization and how personal and political sovereignty can play off against each other. Can we please play Sarah's video now, please? There are three photos. One shows three women, each wearing a wrapper. One has hers tied high up in her chest, another has it slightly higher than her waist, and one has it low on the waist. So two are showing their breasts. The second image shows one man and one woman sat shoulder to shoulder, both wearing wrappers. The man's is at his waist and his chest is showing, and the woman's is draping downwards between her chest and waist, leaving most of her chest showing. The third image shows two women in the road where other people are also walking. Again, one has her wrapper high up on her chest and the other has hers on the waist. These photos were taken by Northcote Thomas, who arrived in Benin City just 12 years after the British forces plundered and set fire to the city. The 1897 so-called punitive expedition destroyed much of Benin's physical and political infrastructure, records of history and artwork. The damage made to Edo political sovereignty also included damage to women's personal and political sovereignty. Some of his photos give insight into how repression and discrimination based on gender have ensued in Benin since colonisation. Before colonisation, Benin women could be with one another, with men and in public without feeling obliged to cover up their breasts. Women's breasts were not seen as body parts that needed to be hidden or as necessarily existing for the sexual service of men. When colonial authorities came, they could not part Benin women from their bodies without killing them, but they tried to alienate them from their bodies. They brought a moral narrative and legal standard of covering, which relegates women's bodies to the realm of the explicit, scandalous and shameful. They must be covered while no such limitation is placed on men. So the pictures highlight how the conception of women's sovereignty as embodied beings has changed. According to public meaning, they no longer have the authority to make certain choices about their bodies. Some of his photos show that such discrimination has not always existed and need not continue to exist. Current sensibilities regarding women's bodies and clothing are grounded in dangerous sexual stereotypes. These are used to repress women's sovereignty and right to choose how to live and act comfortably within their own bodies. Many studies of early African women have focused on outstanding leaders such as Queen Idia, paying less attention to regular women. Chroniclers, including Thomas, often ignored these women's agency. I'm interested in what his pictures show about the history and agency of Benin women, African women, and women more widely that today is forgotten by many, yet can be reclaimed. Women were not as docile or powerless as contemporary literature tends to portray them. The most serious threat to the political and economic sovereignty of women in Nigeria occurred during the 20th century, when patriarchy combined with colonial changes to alter gender relations. As male chiefs collaborated with the British colonial administration in collecting taxes and governing, the position of female chiefs declined in importance. When the economy became increasingly geared towards the production of cash crops to export, women were pushed to the background. The previous system that had prevented land alienation 
gave way to land commercialisation, favouring those with access to money gained from the sale of cash crops. Western style education also largely excluded women from many of the new occupations introduced by colonialism. Thomas's collections linked to a history of political, economic and personal repression. I want to see museums shift how they look at and present objects such as these. Such objects could impact current prejudices facing peoples represented in their collections. Is it socially responsible of museums to permit collections to be translated by a racist and sexist paradigm? Given no context, visitors may rely on the racist and sexist frameworks existing in society and museums. They may assume that these women were ashamed, having had no choice in whether they were exposed for these photographs, or that they were uncivilised for showing their breasts. Given current narratives, collections could support harmful narratives. Museums should provide context for collections they have reason to believe may be taken to bolster continuing ideologies that harm source communities. By being used to highlight how Benin culture and gender relations were prior to colonisation, these images can help deconstruct racist and sexist narratives that paint these women as backwards or naturally powerless. Collection origin should also be made public. Exposing circumstances of collection allows visitors to consider the economic, cultural and social impacts and the discriminatory narratives that museums are entwined with. Also, source communities should be aware of how museums engage with their cultural and economic heritage and should have access to histories of collections, including the scale of what was collected or stolen and who put collections together. This would help understand how narratives are crafted and how we can have a well-informed perspective. For example, Publicising details of the so-called punitive expedition will expose the colonial intrusion as destructive and draw attention to the fact that there was a society established beforehand, one that has now undergone specific historical changes and still exists within a physical and socio-political space susceptible to change. With a better understanding of the origin and journeys of objects, visitors are better able to engage with them, appreciating them for the place they have in history and for the part they could play in creating the future. The way museums and others have attempted to shut down attempts by source communities to reclaim their materials should be made public knowledge, for example by being put on museum plaques. Indeed, plaques and titles could encourage observers to research more into legacies of empire and colonialism. It's more socially responsible and accurate to acknowledge knowledge gaps than to place a collection within a narrative to which it does not belong. Even with gaps, visitors would be able to think critically about what has been what has been presented and to think critically about how and why changes come about, as well as current circumstances, how they can be improved. Conversation shouldn't be limited to what objects tell us about Africa's past, but should extend to what they say about world history, present relations and potential for change. Thomas's images tell us about the interaction of Benin City with Britain how this has had implications on political and personal sovereignty, and how aspects of displaced sovereignty are still available to be reclaimed. Current clothing discrimination against women leaves many of us uncomfortable and is part of wider schemes which use gender and perceived sexual difference as a basis for repression. We can look to the past for lessons on how gender relations can be less discriminatory. Museums should continue using indigenous language and translations to describe the African objects. Museums should consider how their translations will have meaning for source communities. We should identify where museums' approach to language favours colonialists and obfuscates the nature of their impact. Also, we should incorporate indigenous terms for objects and concepts. Including phonetic spellings can be helpful and encourage indigenous engagement, since sometimes the standardised, non-phonetic spelling makes it difficult for indigenous people, who most likely were taught standardised English rather than standardised native languages, to recognise concepts that they know. It's also important to bear in mind conceptual differences. For example, when representing Edo objects and concepts, we should avoid surrendering Edo proverbs to a European scheme of thought that does not have an identical counterpart in meaning. In matters of translation and language, the engagement of source communities should be a priority. Being aware of and foregrounding the sacrifices that are made within the translation and representation process, for example, due to power dynamics or due to the effort to make Edo concepts understandable to others, is a valuable mechanism. There should be recognition that this conversation should be taking place in languages other than English. Reflexive participation from source communities is important for avoiding objectification, and this includes rehumanizing language. For example, not using the terms objects or samples or using numbering where better alternatives are available. Museum collections have vast latent possibilities for clarifying the past and the present, and for creating a better reality. 
incorporating storytelling and interactive sessions would be a good tool for museums to support this creativity. Some of his photographs demonstrate the personal and political sovereignty that Benin women had prior to colonization. Museums can use such allusions to past sovereignties to dispel harmful myths such as that colonization was helpful to those societies and their women. In clarifying the conditions that people lived within in the past, displaced elements of sovereignty are highlighted and may be reclaimed for the future. For example, Benin women may reclaim a less discriminatory code of conduct regarding clothing and their bodies. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. I thought that was a brilliant, rich and provocative discussion on the photographs of Edo women. It had a huge amount of suggestions for museums to understand how to take forward this work. And I hope everybody listening um, to this particular webinar takes those suggestions on board. If you would like to read about what um, Sarah spoke to you just now, um, we've published a blog post uh, under the Writing Race uh, series at the Royal Historical Society, where Sarah's work has been featured. I'd like to now move on to our next student speaker, Zara Ali. Zara is a French and Arabic student at Cambridge, and she is interested in cultural anthropology and its processes. And she's really looking to explore and create new narratives informed by her experiences growing up as a Muslim and as a Hausa Nigerian living in Britain. While her project at the museum looks at ethnomusicology, Zara is also keen to explore the space given to queer and race theory in anthropology. And today Zara is going to discuss two Hausa musical instruments for us, the wooden pan flute and the jaw harp. And she's going to explore for us the relationship between ambiguity and sovereignty. Can we please play Zara's video now? Hi, my name is Zara Ali. I am a French and Arabic student at the University of Cambridge. Um, I was invited to take part in this project by the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and for this section on restitution and sovereignty, I thought to look at two musical instruments, both collected in the 20th century from northern Nigeria, also known as house land. Um, I chose these two artefacts because I feel that they would be really interesting to look at within dialogues, dialogues of restitution due to the sort of ambiguity in their identity. Um, the story of the provenance of these items um, has, a lot, have, has a lot of missing links, unfinished stories and ignored details and I think that um, it's worth kind of looking at ambiguity because it can really it directly relates to sovereignty in my opinion in that if you kind of consider the museum to be sovereign over these items um, as the possess the, the, the one in possession of as the institution in possession of these items then the ambiguity which exists reflects sort of the gaps in what the museum was unable to fill through their processes of historiography. And this ambiguity kind of reflects what the museum in some ways wanted to know, but was unable to know because it wasn't something they could find in written down sources or documents. The historiographic process um, very much relies on written information. And I think that with the nature of um, Hausa history, which I'm going to explore more through this um, presentation, kind of sits in juxtaposition to that and that leaves these artifacts in a position where their identities are kind of ambiguous but there isn't much there, are, there isn't much in the way of um data that the museum could really accurately rely on to fill in these stories but i think that within the devolving restitution um project um this is the opportunity to kind of look at new systems new methods of filling in these gaps and in some ways, these gaps are spaces to really look at what um, understanding an artefact, understanding the identity of an artefact could be with the help of some imagination. The first item I'll be talking about is a wooden pan flute known as a bumper in Hausa. It's a pan flute made up of four bamboo tubes of different lengths tied together. Um, I will be inserting two pictures. One will be a picture retrieved from the museum database and the second one is actually an illustration done by the instruments collector, Major Arthur J. N. Tremont. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. 
um, from his book on how to customs and superstitions. Whilst the stories of the provenance of the two artefacts um, are quite interesting, I thought that it would be worth um, looking at what um, these artefacts were when they were still in Houseland over a century ago. I would imagine that they were used in um, Bori uh, or Mergulzenshi practices, which was the anim animist religion that um, existed in Houseland, which still exists today, but is very underground. Um, Ashri law kind of forbids it. Um, these instruments kind of contributed to these adorcist practices, which adorcist is sort of adorcism is the appreciation a, a religion which um, appreciates spirits rather than exorcism, which is like spirits are bad. We need to cast them out. Um, so within this, musical instruments became a way of like. Um, creating joy and elation within these practices of rare, um, of um, reifying these spirits and appreciating them. There would always be lo loads of drumming, dancing, um, some prayers of course were said as well, but it was very much a time for celebration. Um, and these musical instruments became a means of encouraging that. And within these um, religious ceremonies, you had the Morogi, or the Grio, as is commonly known in English, who kind of existed as the MC slash priest of the event. They would, um, he would have him, like, he would be there singing, recount, like, encouraging the um, rhythm of the event. But also, after the ceremony, became sort of um, the guardian of the memory of the celebrations in that they would... A monarchy would a few days down the line, a few weeks down the line, a few years down the line, reminisce, recollect on these events and recollect on the joy that was experienced in these events. Within discussions of ambiguity, here it's worth looking at memory as a means of kind of explaining the ambiguity. You have memory, which is not entirely reliable. These like we can't remember everything, and the same can be said for these monarchy whilst their profession encourages them to try and remember as much as possible. There is an acceptance that thoughts can be, memories can be mis um, misremembered and forgotten. And with the ambiguity of these artefacts, and we don't know what to entirely do with them now, I think it's worth remembering that um, these instruments come from a tradition of accepting that, um, that history is not rooted in ownership, history is rooted in what we can, what we have up here, I guess. But um, and instruments are just a means of recalling what's here, but they don't signify the history itself. So whilst we sit here and we think, what do we do with these instruments? I think it's it's OK to accept that repatriation is not something to look at within restitution dialogues, because I think that his, as part of the his house history, these instruments just facilitate the remembering of the history and on the history itself, especially for these Moroki, and especially considering that within underground muggles and Chibori practices, these instruments are still made today. Their commonality makes them in some ways quite unremarkable. In um, conversations on restitution, there is always the, the sovereignty that exists for the museum is slightly uncomfortable because it's a reminder of the fact that these collections were born out of colonial exploits to some extent and whilst it might be nice to kind of relinquish the some of the sovereignty through discussions on repatriation and reparation I think there's also value in sitting with that uncomfortability and having uh, of the sovereignty and having the sovereignty as a reminder of the fact that this museum is linked to this history of colonialism and will always be linked to this history of colonialism no matter how uncomfortable we acknowledge our sovereignty to be, it's still going to be there. And I think it's better to just accept that. And I think it could be, it will allow us to be more conscious in our conversations, um, having that uncomfortable sovereignty there. Um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I hope that this exploration into these two um, artifacts was interesting. And I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you so much for that, Zara. Um, I was fascinated by that presentation. I think, you know, you really raised some very, very pertinent points. Um, you talked about where does history really lie? Does it lie with the wooden pan flute? Does it lie with the johab? Or does it lie, as you say, up here? 
is history something, is knowledge something we carry with us as cultural practice? And is that what's really missing from the displays of these objects in, in museum spaces? So I'm going to move on now to our final student speaker for this session, Stanley Onemachalu, who is a Gates Cambridge scholar. And Stanley is studying for his PhD in archaeology at King's College at Cambridge. His research uses the Biafra War and the cultural heritage of the Igbo people to explore the complex relationship between heritage and the legacies of violent conflict. Stanley is the current books reviews editor for the Archaeological Review at Cambridge, and he holds a lectureship in archaeology and heritage studies with the University of Nigeria. Today, Stanley is going to be focusing on the um, Ikenge figures of Igbo Nigeria for us, and he's going to be exploring what sovereignty means with regards to these figures. If sovereignty itself signifies a process of becoming, institutional sovereignty then decides who can become and who can't. So to explore more of this, can we please play Stanley's video now? Hello, everyone. Today, I'll be discussing the Ikenga of Igbo, Nigeria, Nkali, and the Kolo mentality of colonial anthropologists. In many Western museums, the lack of context or provenance for many cultural belongings remains a challenge. This is especially true for African objects and for many objects collected during the colonial times from other places as well. These two quotes by Nana Anyim and Dan Higgs help emphasize this point. Hence, it is not worth repeating that a museum should be decolonized, but how should it do this? In recent times, the issue of decolonization within the heritage museum space has taken on different forms including activism, changes in curricula, seminars and workshops such as this. So I was delighted to be invited to be a part of this workshop by the MAA. But first, I would like to briefly unpack the objects of sovereignty theme for this workshop and set the conceptual foundation for the reflections that would run through this presentation. The objects of sovereignty theme for this project is very instructive. Whereas individual sovereignty denotes the power to live, to aspire and to become. Institutionalized sovereignty is the power to decide who can become and who cannot. Hence, objects, preferably belongings of sovereignty, simply refer to those cultural belongings of communities that hold limitless cultural, cosmological, existential and territorial significance that they cannot be sold, gifted, nor parted with. Being from Igbo land in southeastern Nigeria, I chose to reflect on the Ikenga figures in the MAA. In Igbo cosmology, the Ikenga represents both individual and institutionalized sovereignty. A compound of two Igbo words, Ike, meaning power, and Nga, meaning poise, the Ikenga is generally thought of as a symbol of adventurism, stubborn courage, entrepreneurship and resilience. The Ikenga is a repository of spiritual and cultural meaning for the Igbo. It connects the holder to their ancestors and creator. A typical Ikenga figure looks like a human with two ram-like horns holding a machet in the right hand and a human head or pot or calabash in the left hand. The style and shape of the Ikenga might vary across some Igbo communities. It could be a scarified animal or human face with two horns or something else on its head. It could be sitting or standing. The most significant features of the Ikenga, however, are the horns and the machet. These are said to be emblematic of the daredevil nature and the dogged desire of the Igbo to achieve greatness and blaze through any obstacles. The Ikenga can be owned individually or communally as a family or community. Where it is owned by an individual, they are usually buried with it when they die. But when it is owned by the community, the ownership is transferred from one generation to another. The Ikenga dignifies the individual, their family or community, and it speaks to their worldviews and aspirations. The Ikenga symbolizes the inalienable rights of the holders to be and to become. So, why will anyone give away their Ikenga? 
especially to a stranger. How did such object of sovereignty end up in the MAA? Could it have been gifted to colonial anthropologist Thomas Northcote or the Church Missionary Society's Reverend J. Amitage Robinson, for example? If so, what do we know about the power dynamics that may have informed such gifts in the colonial times? How is the Kenga represented in the MAA? Does this matter? This workshop by the MAA was designed to tackle these kinds of questions. Although it may not provide all the answers, but it is enough to begin the conversation and offer informed explanations. Again, Dan Hicks offers some explanation here. From the foregoing, Hicks calls the disciplines of anthropology and its close relative, archaeology, into question as tools employed by colonizers for and towards colonial injustices. The fundamental instrument of sovereignty, the theme of this workshop, is Nkali, an Igbo word loosely translated to mean power over. Nkali can be given, inherited, or acquired, and with it, sovereignty. Similarly, Nkali can be abused to dispossess, malign, or destroy one's sovereignty. Slavery and colonialism brought about the dispossession of the other's individual and institutionalized sovereignty. Yet, sadly, many of the Kenga figures in the MAA are proceeds of colonial anthropological expeditions in Igbo land. It is no surprise then that their representation of the Ikenga, as seen from their website and represented here through this word cloud, is filled with discrepancies and is mostly silent on the context, use, or symbolism of the Ikenga for the Igbo people. One reason for this could be the awful lot of data loss that happens around the collections, transcription, or transfer process in the museum. However, a more, a more plausible reason is Kolo collecting. Kolo is a Nigerian English pidgin word meaning craze or madness. I use it here to describe the hasty and shoddy collecting and gathering of the other's belongings that characterized the extractive capitalist colonial anthropology of the 19th and 20th centuries. I propose here that in addition to the museum's own inefficiency, Kolo collecting may have contributed to the museum's loss of context, provenance, and essence for many cultural belongings like the Ikenga from Igbo land and other colonized cultures. As though there was this mad rush by colonial anthropologists to Kolo collect as much cultural belongings as possible to prove a point or brag to their European counterparts that I was there, see, proof. Kolo collecting places more interest on the physical or aesthetic attributes of objects than on the people who made them or their stories. Granted, physical descriptions are important too, especially in the museum space, but placing emphasis only on the physical attributes of other people's cultural belongings is an aberration. It would be more appropriate if the museum also told its audience what they mean, where they are from, and why or how these cultural belongings ended up in front of them behind a glass. In conclusion, any cultural belonging in the museum has ties to a collector. collector. Any cultural belongings in the museum that has ties to a collector collector or that a museum cannot show satisfactory evidence that it was acquired ethically should be put up for restitution in consultation with source communities. I imagine that there will be cases where the communities may elect not to have the objects back, but choose an alternative form of restitution that leaves the museum with the object under a new arrangement. This new arrangement could consist monetary compensations, payment of royalties, copyright protection statements, ownership acknowledgements, or investment in human capital development. It might also be naming a gallery after the source community or setting up a scholarship to support students from the community. I guess the point here is, in devolving restitution and in decolonizing the museum, caution must be taken not to use Nkali, whether academic or professional, to exclude source communities again or deny them agency. Restitution should be a co-creative and collaborative process with the involvement of source communities from start to finish. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that, Stanley. And I, I think I should also mention here that Stanley's work has been featured on the RHS's Writing Race um, blog series. It was published on Monday, and I think the link is in the chat already for you. Um, both he and Sarah have uh, contributed to this, uh, to this blog post. So I'm going to conclude by um, uh, putting together a few remarks that link these wonderful student presentations together. I hope you all agree with me that they were truly fascinating insights. Um, please let us know what you think in, in um, using the chat function on Zoom. I was particularly struck at how well the, the videos spoke to one another and how much you know, we don't know about these objects. Uh, you know, this is a point that has come up before in today's webinar. So let's start with, with Amel's work. Um, Amel talks about um, the history of this cloak, and she also mentions how this history of the cloak has 70 years of uh, unaccounted for and even makes its way to India, but we don't know how. And she raises the really important point, I think, about the significance of oral history here. And the fact that we really need to understand that this cloak um, is not simply an object of beauty, but an object of contestation, an object of struggle within the theme of sovereignty. Let's move on to René. So René's work really focused on the sheer richness of history that we're missing out on if we don't place enough value on the, on the cult cultural significance of objects. And I really loved how well she knit her own personal history of her grandmother's gift of earrings to the gold earrings she chose to analyze. Sarah's work, I thought, turned the focus really to reclaiming the agency of women through colonial photographs, um, particularly insightful observations here. And what's really stayed with me from Sarah's presentation um, was the pertinent questions she raised. Are students being at uh, our museums being socially conscious when they display such colonial photographs without any context? How can we encourage the potential for change? I also really enjoyed her reflections on language and the problem of translation here. You know, how, how can indigenous source communities engage conceptually with objects in museums? In Zara's presentation, I, I really enjoyed her demonstrating for us through the house of musical instruments, how history is not rooted in ownership, but in internal knowledge and practices, which as she rightly says, we carry with us. So I think Zara really questions here, what is history and what is knowledge? And I think is, there is so much value in museums um, sitting with their discomfort of being complicit in the history of colonialism and letting that filter through in its displays of collections as well. So I'm very much with you here, Zara. And then finally, Stanley's work. Um, it seemed to me that a core tenet of his observation was, you know, how did the Ikenga come to be at the MAA in the first place? You know, why would anyone, an individual or a community who owned it, why would they have ever parted with it? And Stanley was very clear um, in his viewpoint that any object that has not been acquired ethically should be put up for restitution, but this should be done in cons consultation with source communities, and that we should not again be uh, denying source communities agency within the restitution process. So I, I'd really like to bring this wonderful session um, to a close by inviting all of you in thanking our wonderful, absolutely brilliant student speakers. So let's have, if we can, a round of applause for them. And then I'd like to hand back to Benjamina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adia, and thank you all for all the presentations. Um, you, you, can, you can check the chat, I mean, there's a lot of conversation going on. Uh, and on a personal level, I'm uh, blown away by the concept of uh, color collecting, which um, I was just posting in the, in the chat, but I think can be applied also to, um, you know, the museum practice itself in many instances. Um, and, you know, the, the, some of the issues that I think for example, Zoe and uh, Marianne brought up uh, in their presentation the sort of discrepancies between, um, you know, archival data and sort of uh, database um, information. So 
um, I'm really, really grateful for all the insight um, that we have received through these, um, these presentations. Um, I would, if you are on the internet, in the interwebs, um, I would encourage you to, um, to share any uh, additional thoughts you have um, on Twitter with us. Uh, you can do so with the hashtag DevRest. Um, and I'm going to put that in the, um, in the chat so that you, um, you see that. Um, so you can use uh, the hashtag DevRest to share your thoughts. Um, you can also uh, tag us. So you can tag a Ford underscore UK or MA Cambridge, um, and we'll be able to share some of that, um, some of that thinking uh, with uh, with everyone.